December 23rd. We arrived at Port Desire, situated in latitude 47 degrees on the coast of Patagonia. The creek runs for about 20 miles inland with an irregular width. The Beagle anchored a few miles within the entrance in front of the ruins of an old Spanish settlement. The same evening, I went on shore. The first landing in any new country is very interesting, and especially when, as in this case, the whole aspect bears the stamp of a marked and individual character. At the height of between 200 and 300 feet, above some masses of porphyry, a wide plain extends, which is truly characteristic of Patagonia. The surface is quite level and is composed of well-rounded shingle mixed with the whitish earth. Here and there, scattered tufts of brown, wiry grass are supported, and still more rarely, some low, thorny bushes. The weather is dry and pleasant, for the fine blue sky is but seldom obscured. When standing in the middle of one of these desert palms, the view on one side is generally bounded by the escarpment of another plain, rather higher, but equally level and desolate, and on the other side it becomes indistinct. From the trembling mirage which seems to rise from the heated surface. The plains are traversed by many broad, flat-bottomed valleys, and in these the bushes grow rather than rather more abundantly. The present drainage of the country is quite insufficient to excavate such large channels. In some of the valleys, ancient scented trees, growing in the very center of the dry watercourse, seem as if placed to prove how long a time had elapsed since any flood had passed that way. We have evidence from the shells lying on the surface that the plains of gravel have been elevated within a recent epoch above the level of the sea. And we must look to that period from the excavation of the valleys by the slowly retiring waters. From the dryness of the climate, a man may walk for days together over these plains without finding a single drop of water. Even at the base of the porphyry hills, there are only a few small wells containing but little water, and that rather saline and half putrid. In such a country, the fate of the Spanish settlement was soon decided. The dryness of the climate during the greater part of the year and the occasional hostile attacks of the wandering Indians compelled the colonists to desert their half-finished buildings. The style, however, in which they were commenced showed the strong and liberal hand of Spain in the old time. The end of all the attempts to colonize the site of America, south of 41 degrees, have been miserable. At Port Famine, the name expresses the lingering and extreme sufferings of several hundred wretched people, of whom one alone survived to rel relate their misfortunes. At St. Joseph's Bay on the coast of Patagonia, a small settlement was made, but during one Sunday the Indians made an attack and massacred the whole party, excepting two men who were led captive many years among the wandering tribes. At the Rio Negro, I conversed with one of these men, now in extreme old age. The zoology of Patagonia is as limited as its flora. On the arid plains, a few black beetles, heteromera, might be seen slowly crawling about, and occasionally a lizard darting from side to side. Of birds, we have three carrion hawks, and in the valleys of few finches and insect feeders. The Ibis melanops, a species said to be found in Central Africa, is not uncommon on the most desert parts. In the stomachs of these birds, I found grasshoppers, cicidae, small lizards, and even scorpions. At one time of the year, they go in flocks. At another, in pairs. Their cry is very loud and singular and resembles the neighing of the guanaco. I will here give an account of this latter animal, which is very common and is the characteristic quadruped of the plains of Patagonia. The guanaco, which by some naturalists is considered as the same animal with the llama, 
but in its wild state is the South American representative of the camel of the East. In size, it may be compared to an ass, mounted on taller legs and with a very long neck. The guanaco abounds over the whole of the temperate parts of South America, from the wooded islands of the Tierra del Fuego through Patagonia, the hilly parts of La Pata, Chile, even to the Cordillera of Peru. Although preferring on an elevated site, it yields in this respect to its near relative, the vicuna. On the plains of southern Patagonia, we saw them in greater numbers than in any other part. Generally, they go in small herds, from half a dozen to thirty together. But on the banks of the St. Cruz, we saw one herd, which must have contained at least five hundred. On the northern shores of the Strait of Magellan, they are also very numerous. Generally, the guanacos are wild and extremely wary. Mr. Stokes told me that one day he saw through a glass a herd of these beasts, which evidently had been frightened, running away at full speed, although their distance was so great that they could not be distinguished by the naked eye. The sportsman frequently receives the first intimation of their presence by hearing from a long distance, the peculiar shrill neighing note of the alarm. If he then looks attentively, he will perhaps see the herd standing in a line on the side of some distant hill. On approaching them, a few more squeals are given, and then off they set at an apparent slow, but really quick canter along some narrow beaten track to a neighboring hill. If, however, by chance, he should abruptly meet a single animal, or several together, they will generally stand motionless and intently gaze at him, then perhaps move on a few yards, turn round and look again. What is the cause of this difference in their shyness? Do they mistake a man in distance for their chief enemy, the puma? Or does curiosity overcome their timidity? That they are curious is certain, for if a person lies on the ground and plays strange antics, such as throwing up his feet in the air, they will almost always approach by degrees to reconnoitre him. It was an artifice that was repeatedly practiced by our sportsmen with success, and they had moreover the advantage of allowing several shots to be fired, which were all taken as parts of the performance. On the mountains of Tierra de Fuego and in other places, I had more than once seen a gua guanaco on being approached not only neigh and squeal, but prance and leap about in the most ridiculous manner, apparently in defiance as a challenge. These animals are very easily domesticated, and I have seen some thus kept near their houses, although at large on their native plains. They are in this state very bold, and readily attack a man by striking him from behind with both knees. It is asserted that the motive for these attacks is jealousy, on account of their females. The wild guanacos, however, have no idea of defense. Even a single dog will secure one of these large animals till the huntsman can come up. In many of their habits, they like sheep in a flock. Thus, when they see men approaching in several directions on horseback, they soon become bewildered and not know which way to run. This greatly facilitates the Indian method of hunting for they are thus easily driven to a central point and are encompassed. The guanacos readily take to the water several times at Port Valdez. They were seen swimming from island to island. Byron, in his voyage, say he saw them drinking salt water. Some of our officers likewise saw a herd of apparently drinking the briny fluid from a salina near Cape Blanco. I imagine in several parts of the country, if they do not drink salt water, they drink none at all. In the middle of the day, they frequently roll in the dust in saucer-shaped hollows. The males fight together two one day pass quite close to me, squealing and trying to bite each other, and several were shot with their hides deeply scored. Herds sometimes appear to set out on exploring parties at Bahia Blanca, where within 30 miles of the coast, these animals are extremely infrequent. I one day saw the tracks of 30 or 40 which had come 
in a direct line to a muddy salt water creek.